can't see you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you guys could join us today for Art for Lunch. I'm Sandy Scott. I'm the Director of Marketing. I'd like to go over a couple of events we have going on this month. So tomorrow night we have family night, which is a, a wonderful opportunity for you to bring your kids and grandkids and enjoy some um, art projects we will have throughout the building. And we're going to have the Georgia Reptile Society here along with Bear Creek Nature Center, where everyone can actually touch some of the reptiles and animals. So that begins tomorrow, November 4th at 4 o'clock to 7.30, and it's free admission for everyone from 4 to 7.30. So we hope that you'll join us and bring your family, friends, um, out tomorrow night. Also, we have a couple of spots left for Homeschool Friday, which is this Friday. The deadline to register is today. It's, the topic's gonna be Navajo-inspired textile designs, and um, it's 1 to 2.30 this Friday, November 5th. Like I said, the deadline is today. Uh, by the end of the day, go to boothmuseum.org to register. And then if you can't come to this Homeschool Friday, we also have an upcoming one for December. It's uh, inspired by Tony and Beta, and um, that's December 3rd. And that, like I said, that's 1 to 2.30. And the deadline to register for that is December 1st. Go to boothmuseum.org to register. We also have um, Thursday, November 18th, one of our favorite times of the year, which is our 18th annual Kids Cowboy Up exhibition opening and reception. So these are the um, kids from the Boys and Girls Club of Bartow County and the Hands of Christ. And we put this, ex we just welcome you on Thursday, November 18th, 5 to 7. And you can stay for the sculpture unveiling and the evening lecture with Mick Dollinger. So that is on Thursday, November 18th as, uh, as well. We're asking that guests meet at the front desk instead of going straight to Bergman because we're going to have the sculpture unveiling um, of the getaway, which is the sculpture that's located outside the cafe. If you haven't checked it out, check out that beautiful sculpture by Mick Dollinger. And then uh, it'll be unveiled at 7 p.m. And then he will actually, everyone will move to the Bergman Theater and he'll discuss that project. So that is no, Thursday, November 18th, 7 p.m. Well, then uh, November, De December 1st, we have our next Art for Lunch. We hope that you guys will join us, and that's Mark Warren, one of our favorite uh, authors. He's going to be here to discuss his new book, and he will be available to sign, and we will also have uh, books available for purchase. And that's Wednesday, December 1st at 12.15. If you can't join us, of course, we're always streaming to Facebook. We also have Art for Lunch and Art Demonstration by Mark Choctaw, that's Wednesday, December 15th at 12.15, and that will just stream to Facebook, Booth Museum's Facebook page. We also have another family activity. If you're wondering what to do during the holiday break with your kiddos or grandkids, please bring them out to the Booth Museum. We have the holiday um, open studios, and that's December 21st, Tuesday, December 21st from 10 to 4. We're going to have activities uh, in Borderlands Gallery. Of course, uh, admission applies. Children 12 and, and under are free always. And then, of course, free to our members. We invite you out that day. Today, I'd like to um, introduce our speaker today. And she's our director of marketing. Uh, not, she's not the marketing director. She's the director of education. Um, she is responsible for creating content for our educational programs, also organizing our open studios and our family nights, and educator weekends, and so much more. Please put your hands together for Patty Dees. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. So excited to have you guys here today. So excited to share this amazing trip with everyone. 
Um, it is aptly titled Colorado or Bust, uh, the 2021 Circle Member Trip of a Lifetime, because it indeed was a trip of a lifetime. It's a couple of uh, folks in the audience that were able to attend the trip, a Circle Level member, so um, I'm sure they uh, will uh, be able to, to jump in if they want to at any time. Feel free to add any additional information. Um, it was such a fantastic trip. But um, as Sandy mentioned, I am the Director of Education. And um, on this trip, it was really such an incredible experience. And what I would like to share from it really is a lot of the personal stories that the artists shared with us. Taking a look at their personal spaces, their studios, their homes, we were invited into all of these. Um, we visited no less than 13 artists in their homes um, and studios, plus numerous galleries and several private collections, um, including the private Tom Petrie collection of Remington's. That was amazing. No, no photos on that one, though. Um, and... Um, we also spent, uh, it was seven days total for the trip, so just to give you an idea of the length of it. Uh, we were in Denver, Loveland, Colorado Springs, and Steamboat Springs, so we were on the go, go, go the entire time. And to make a long story short, our days generally followed this pattern. We got up, we ate food, we traveled to artist studio, we ate more food. We traveled to another artist studio, and we had lunch, more food. <laughs> We'd visit an artist's home, there would be more food, and um, at night, of course, we had dinner. So lots of food. It was fantastic. <laughs> that, of course, was not overshadowed. The, the art, uh, artists and the artist visits and, the, and their stories and their personal studios, that, of course, was a, the most important aspect of the trip. But food wasn't bad either, just saying. If you're a foodie like me, it was pretty great. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to make sure that I have this turned on so that it works properly. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started, maybe. Oh, sorry. I, Lindsay turned it on and then I turned it off. That works great. Um, all right, so what you're seeing here is our first image of us coming out of Denver. We were heading to Colorado Springs on the bus. And this was my first trip to Colorado. I've been through the airport several times, but never actually in the state of Colorado other than the airport. And there were a couple of other members on the trip as well. So we were really just immediately blown away by the landscape um, right, out, right out of the gate. Um, we were divided into two groups. We were on two different buses to travel. We were the sculpture group and the painters group. And in the sculptors group, we had Seth and uh, Joyce and myself. And um, as far as the booth staff and the painters group, Lisa and Diane were there um, representing curatorial and membership, of course. So uh, it was a fun time here. You can see both Seth and Lisa giving an overview of some of the artists as we were on their way to their studios. But on the trip, it wasn't long before we saw the aspens in bloom everywhere. Um, fortune would have it, we were there at precisely the right week. Um, we hit a seven to eight day window when the aspens uh, were at their peak color. Uh, and honestly, the camera just does not do them justice. They were fluorescent in color. It looked like fire coming down the sides of a mountain at times when you would come around a corner. Um, this is another just sweeping view of the landscape. Um, it opened up to all of these beautiful vistas like this. The cottonwoods were in bloom as well. So they lent this beautiful kind of golden hue to that, that fiery um, color of the aspens. It was just breathtaking. So one of our first stops uh, was here at Garden of the Gods uh, Resort and Club, and I think it's aptly named, don't you? Look at this vista. This was what we saw on that title slide. Um, this, was, this is called Perkins Central Garden uh, in this image on the left, uh, and on the right is another image of the grounds, but it was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, this red rock formation in front of us, you could see from every viewpoint of the resort, and I kept looking for this um, rock formation called the Kissing Camels. We would drive by this golf course that was across the street, and it was called the Kissing Camels Golf Course. And I thought, where are these Kissing Camels? I cannot find these Kissing Camels anywhere. They had been in front of my face the entire time. They were part of this rock formation. <laughs> See the red arrow? That's where I needed to be looking the entire time. Uh, and this, this is a close-up view of the kissing camels. If you get a little closer, you can see they actually do look like kissing camels. So. <clears throat> took me a few minutes to figure that out, let me say. So even the wildlife couldn't resist the beauty of this place. Here are two mule deer, I believe that Seth, and was, Joyce, is this yours or Seth's photo? 
uh, Joyce's photo, let me correct myself, of the mule deer out on the property enjoying the grounds like everyone else. And actually, before we arrived at Garden of the Gods, we stopped by our first artist studio, Ezra Tucker. So Ezra Tucker, uh, we have a couple of pieces in our collection. These are just two um, that I chose to, to put up on the slides here today. But um, you can see here his focus uh, with these are on African Americans in the West. But he has a much wider focus than that. Here's Ezra in his studio, and they were, Ezra and his family were the most gracious hosts. First of all, his wife and his son are both artists, so it was um, great to be surrounded by three different artists in this home and seeing different types of their work. His wife was a jewelry artist. Um, his son does scratch board, which is incredible. Um, the detail is amazing. Ezra focuses um, on painting and he, he uses mostly acrylics, which I think is amazing because of the rich color that he really um, is able to bring out in his works. Um, you can see in the center here in Ezra's studio, there's a painting of a very famous um, person in Western history, uh, Bass Reeves, and he was actually very surprised that we knew who this was. But Seth explained to him that we do a lot of educational programs and Bass Reeves is um, one of those uh, important figures of the American West that's often covered by by us. He was the first black deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi. If you don't know who he is, he served for 35 years um, doing this type of work uh, and uh, is a figure that's often left out of the history books because he's African American. So today we're learning more and more about the contributions of uh, African Americans to the West and I think he was painting this to get ready for an exhibition. Um, is that right? Yeah, Joyce is saying yes. Um, so it was heading to an exhibition and he was finishing that up. But his real focus is wildlife. Um, that's his real passion and his real love. And you can see behind him in the studio, there's a couple of paintings of his wildlife um, on the walls. Now, when he started out, his parents didn't think he could make any money as an artist. He did go to art school. Um, and 10 days after his graduation in 1977, he went to work for Hallmark Carts. Um, he considered that his graduate school. And uh, he was able to make a living, a very successful living as an artist. We obviously can see that now, but by age 26, he was a much sought after illustrator. Um, he secured agents in Chicago and Los Angeles and quickly became one of Southern California's leading artists for hire. He worked for Coors, Anheuser-Busch, Disney, SeaWorld, 20th Century Fox, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, I could go on and on. Um, pretty impressive curriculum vitae. Um, now his focus, again, is mostly on studying and painting wildlife in every form. He likes to paint their, their unique shapes and colors and textures, and that's really his focus. The reason I have this slide up is because it's a personal interest of mine. Um, I think Joyce and I both kind of gasped when he brought this poster out because have any of you guys ever heard of the movie The Never Ending Story? Please say yes. Ah, oh, yes. So 1984. Um, I was a teenager, but it was one of my favorite movies, and my daughter, who is now um, not a teenager anymore, but it still was one of her favorite movies, so it's something that my daughter and I kind of bonded and enjoyed. So to see him bring this poster out and to know he was the artist that created this artwork for this poster, um, I was just in awe of that. I quickly took a snapshot, sent it to my daughter, and um, I got points for that. Uh, so, so. Yeah, Ezra and his family, again, incredible, gracious hosts, beautiful home. You can get a little bit of a better look at his wildlife paintings in the back of this one, but we're going to move on to our next artist, Thomas Blackshear. I love Thomas Blackshear. Um, so we boarded the bus the next morning for Thomas's studio, and I will say I was starstruck because I, this painting is one that really resonates in our education department because it is one that students really respond to. Um, we use it in a lot of different programs, and um, it's a great one to engage uh, students in conversation. Um, so I was really excited to meet Thomas, and here we are in his studio. And when you walk in his studio, you're a bit overwhelmed. All the artist studios were a little bit different, just like every person is different. Um, some were tiny in living rooms, some were in historic houses, some were multi-level workspaces. Thomas's was a pretty good size. It was in a, in a warehouse, and he had stuff everywhere, everywhere. When you walked in, you really didn't know where to look, um, 
but there were toys and figurines and posters and movie props and magazines and prints and you name it, it was there because he is really a jack of all trades. He is such a skilled artist. Um, he's, you know, he can work in just about, seem like any medium. And um, you could definitely see that in his studio, it reflected it. So here you can see Thomas showing his current work on um, indigenous um, portraits here on the table, some of his studies um, being shown. And to the right, he's actually holding um, the best-selling African-American figurine of all time in his hands. He sculpted that. I can't remember the name of the company this was under, but Linux eventually bought that company, um, just to kind of give you an idea. He also worked for Hallmark Cards, and he was friends with Ezra Tucker. They were there at the same time, and I think that's really cool. So they're really good friends, both highly successful artists in their own right. Um, he went on to also work for Disney Pictures, George Lucas Studios, Universal Studios, and International Wildlife and National Geographic magazines. Yeah. Um, again, impressive curriculum vitae. But what I think um, about Thomas is, I guess one of the things that I enjoyed the most about him is how personable he really was. He shared so many stories with us. Um, it's hard to really kind of capture which one I wanted to share, uh, but I did, and I'm going to share it in just a minute, but I wanted you to take another look at his studio, just a few more images to share with you of his work. I got really excited when I saw this overhead projector. I just, just have to say, does anyone else get excited when they see overhead projectors? Yes. Me, no, Jennifer just raised her hand. <laughs> any for, educator of any type, I think, um, at one point, I just think they are the most amazing thing ever, and they should never, ever go away. Um, but Thomas, I was pleased to see him using it. Um, obviously, he's, he's a skilled artist beyond belief. Um, he, this actually just saves him time by projecting it where he can sketch it out so he doesn't have to do double duty. If he sketched a small sketch, he can put it on an overhead projector and enlarge it really quickly. Um, so I just thought that was really uh, fun to see that. So this is the story that I wanted to share uh, from Thomas Blackshear. So he was the only one that had the courage to get a photo with because I was not leaving that studio without a photo with him. It was not going to happen. Um, so I think Joy snapped this photo of me with Thomas here. And in the, in the center, you can see um, an image that is really well known. This is an image, um, no matter uh, your, your religious or spiritual beliefs, it's just an image that's around kind of everywhere that a lot of people recognize. Um, and there's a story that Thomas shared with us that just sent chills up my spine. It was about Mother Teresa. Uh, and, you know, she's a great humanitarian, um, regardless of whatever religious or spiritual beliefs you may have. He, um, he had uh, very, very strong ties with this particular artwork, um, and he said it, it really led him down a lot of different paths uh, that were pretty miraculous. So he wanted to share his story of Mother Teresa, so I did capture that in the video, so we're going to hear that now. Missions trips, and one time uh, some friends went to India, Calcutta, and... Um, they really wanted to see Mother Teresa, so they were outside of her compound, but they didn't know how to get in there. So the last day they were on their missions trip, they were just sitting there looking up at the, the compound, and what I would do is I would give prints of some of my artwork to people going on a mission, so I tell them, you know, whoever you felt God tells you to give them to, give them to them, and that's what they would do. So they were sitting there just hoping they could go and see Mother Teresa, but they didn't know how to get in there. And all of a sudden, this kid comes up and says, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, come, come. And grabs them by the hand, pulls them into an alley, and goes into this door. And there's this uh, group of uh, Asian uh, diplomats or whatever, I guess, going to see Mother Teresa. And they just march right in behind them. <laughs> and they get in there, and she's sitting in her wheelchair. And... Uh, you know, when my friends go up to present to her and they say, you know, you've done so much for so many people now, we'd like to give you something. And they take out my prints, two of them, and they give her my prints and said, we'd like to give this to you. And she was so touched, she said, do you mind if I put this uh, in the home of the dying? And they said, you can put them anywhere you want to put them. And, 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 she, and she was so thankful and grateful. So they called me up and I was just blown away. I said, you got to be kidding me, you know. So... Uh, a year later, one of the people who was with my friend, one of the missionaries, he went back to India, and when he was in the airport, a nun came up to him and said, 
you were here last year. And he said, yes, I was. How, how did you know? She says, I was there. I was the one uh, helping Mother Teresa with her wheelchair. And so I was standing there when you presented her with those prints, and she said, would you like me to take you around to see the different compounds and the, the different missions we have? He said, sure. And of course, he was hoping he would see where they placed the, the paintings. So after they did a tour, uh, he didn't see any of the paintings. So he said, I'm, I thought I was going to see the paintings. And she, she said, because Mother Teresa said she would like to put them in the home of the dying. And the nun said, no, no, you misunderstood. She said, do you mind if I put them in the home of one who is dying? And she was talking about herself. Aww. And they turned her room into a shrine, and on one wall is one print, and on the other wall is the other print. Oh so, so, but, um, but I so, yeah. If you didn't get chills from that, you're not human. <laughs> uh, that was, yeah, I mean, I can't say any more about that. Whew. So, um, we headed, headed out after that amazing experience and hearing these, these personal stories in these private spaces, which when you really think about it, uh, thinking about Seth's connections, it's amazing. Uh, the people that he knows, uh, the ability to, um, to put these trips together and get us into these artists' homes and private spaces and how willing they are to share with us. So that, that is something special to note about these circle trips. Um, at the end, uh, we ended the evening with cocktails and dinner at the uh, Cheyenne Mountain Country Club, hosted by uh, John and Becky Marzoff. Um, and uh, they were just, again, gracious hosts. We actually uh, had a uh, dinner at their home uh, a fo the following evening, and they had some beautiful, beautiful artwork in place. Um, We'll move on to our next artist, uh, Dustin Van Wetchel. Dustin has visited the booth before. He actually has gone out to a high school here to visit with some of the art students with uh, Kent, our Art Academy manager. And he will be here in 2023 to do a painting workshop down at our Booth Art Academy. So don't miss that. Um, He's not yet represented in our collection, but hopefully he will be soon. Uh, but he has a strong background in illustration and graphic design. Um, and one of the best things about him was that he had Krispy Kreme donuts when we walked in. Just saying. Um, everyone gravitated towards the Krispy Kreme donuts, even though they were full already. You hear the, oh, <gasps> Krispy Kreme. You got to have one of those. Okay. <clears throat> I told you I was a, a foodie. Um, after, uh, after he graduated, he moved to Southern California to work in an art department for a software company, and that's where he said uh, it gave him his appreciation for deadlines, and he runs his art um, studio like a business. There was not a stitch of paint anywhere in this studio except on the canvas ex precisely where it was supposed to be. Um, and he kind of, you know, joked about himself with that, but he, it's impeccable, um, but that goes to, to uh, really tell you a lot about his style as an artist, his attention to detail. He liked to stress the fact that texture was really, really important and that he felt that that was something that a lot of artists tend to miss. So uh, he was really focused on building up texture in his work um, with uh, brush strokes and uh, palette knife. This particular work is, was about 16 by 20. It's an oil on board and it's one of his favorite topics to paint. Can you guys make out what kind of animals those are? Close. Any, anyone else remember? Mountain. Yes, Meg got it. Mountain goat. Yeah. So he loves mountain goats. That was one of the animals. He named another one. I don't remember. Maybe it's a pronghorn that he, he named it a second. I don't remember. But the sheep, he absolutely loved. And he will only paint an animal if he's observed it in the wild. So he's an avid hiker. Um, grew up in Arizona with his father going, going out on hikes and developed a deep appreciation for nature at a very young age. Um, and today climbs to all heights to observe these animals in the wild. This one in particular I thought was uh, really cute because if you look at the mountain goat in the center of the painting, his head is going like this. He's got that quizzical tilt to his head because they had just come up over the ridge and Dustin was sitting there and they couldn't figure out, one, what are you? And two, why are you here? So they kind of just stood there, and, and uh, it was a perfect capture for him in this piece, I think. So he was finishing this up. I believe this had already been sold. And he also made some interesting comments about uh, how, the, with the art world changing, he's selling art on Instagram like this. 
And he said he just couldn't get over the fact that someone would buy his artwork without actually seeing it first. So we're seeing that kind of as a trend with a couple of other young um, contemporary artists are hearing that as well. But again, very gracious. His wife works for Fine Arts Connoisseur Magazine. Um, uh, and um, again, just a beautiful space. We were able to see lots of his, his artwork um, that day. We moved on from Dustin's um, studio to have lunch at the Falcon Club. Uh, this is at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So this is one of the images first coming into the Air Force Base, or to the Academy, I should say. And here we are having lunch, and we were really fortunate to be visited by a very, very dear friend of Seth and Joyce's, um, Tim Newton. And Tim has been to the museum uh, quite a few times. We all recognize him because he's super friendly. Um, but he is the publisher of Western Art and Architecture magazine. So he joined us uh, on a couple of places along on the trip, and he brought his sweet little blind dog, Molly. She was so sweet. Uh, so he was able to, um, to take her uh, on this journey with us. As we were leaving the Falcon Club, these are just some of the images um, of the entire property of that area as we were driving out on the bus. And then we headed to William Matthews Studio. Now you may recognize this watercolor. Uh, this was on a lot of our member brochure pieces in the past. Um, what's interesting about William Matthews, he's also another jack of all trades. Um, but he doesn't necessarily consider himself a Western artist, even though he has work in the Gene Autry Heritage Museum, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, the Idol Jorg, and the Booth. So we consider him a Western artist. <laughs> but he's done a lot. Uh, we were in his studio, which was in this beautiful historic building. I think he said it was an old steel mill, um, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, I may have that wrong. It's a historic building nonetheless, but um, it's actually a very, very large space. We entered in, we could see lots of his different type of artwork. Um, here we had lunch. Uh, this was fun. Here you see Seth standing beside these two gigantic ties. Um, so he uses his studio kind of as a laboratory, he explained. He said sometimes he'll even take art off the wall and change it and, and ruin it by, and then have to throw it away. Um, so I thought that was interesting, but these, these large Western ties kind of took off and um, there, he uses acrylic to paint the image on the tie and you can see here where in his studio where it opened up this vast space and all of these different rooms that we were kind of trailing through and listening to him and he took us into a room with lots of these ties and um, talked to us a little bit and shared his stories with the group. Now another story he shared with us that I'm, yes. No, no, they're, they're, they were uh, material. Yeah, they were, mm -hmm. yeah, and he painted directly on them with acrylic. I can't remember if he mentioned the material, but do you remember, Joyce, or? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. um, but it was a soft, soft fabric, yeah. Um, this building uh, is in Fort Worth, Texas. It's the Dickies uh, Public Arena, but there was a competition for this in 2019 and uh, for the artwork installations, and he won the south side of this. And what you're looking at here is a mosaic, a glass tile mosaic made of 600,000 tiles, 570 colors, made from an Italian glass recipe that had been passed down for generations by 28 women in Mexico whose grandmothers had worked for Diego Rivera. I know. I know. Um, so it took uh, nine and a half months for the women to create the mosaic tile um, tiles to go into this installation. He actually worked out his, his idea in a studio in Mexico with Buckeye Blake, who's a member of the Cherokee Nation and very famous artist, who actually created the two relief bronze relief sculptures you see on either side of this. Um, those were an additional hundred thousand dollars. I think he mentioned the project was over a million. Um, big, obviously massive project, uh, but it was fifty feet above the ground. Um, with scaffolding to be able to install this. And uh, the story of this is called Los 
Caballos, and um, it's about the importance of the horse and, as an enduring symbol of the West, and how when the horse was introduced from Spain, how it transformed the West, uh, the Great Plains, uh, Native Americans, and the pioneer's life. So that's what this the theme is in the reflection here. And the bronze relief sculptures by Buckeye Blake, one represents a cowboy and one represents an indigenous person. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, here's an up-close look at the mural just to give you an idea. Um, so on from there, we have to have a baby picture. There's a baby involved in the tour. This is Kwong Ho. We visited the studio of Kwong Ho. Kwong Ho has been here before. Um, he's done workshops here. He's provided lectures. Uh, Kwong Ho is a um, amazing person, uh, very welcoming. We were in his studio with his wife, who's also an accomplished artist, Adrian Stein, and they just had a baby. His name was Liam. So I had to stop for baby pictures. Um, this is Kwong with Liam, and this is Seth with Liam, um, who was uh, just giggling and giggling in the best little personality, the baby, not Seth. Um, though Seth was Definitely in a good mood with that baby for sure. Um, so as beautiful as, as it was in Colorado Springs, we headed to Denver next where we stayed at the historic Brown Palace. And this opened in 1892 and in the spirit of the season, some say it's haunted. And I can't say for sure, but I can tell you that the elevator liked to stop at the fifth floor a lot. So that's all I'll say. But directly across from the Brown Palace, uh, was the American Museum of Western Art, and this houses the Anschutz Collection. And we were given a private tour. This was a multi-level historic building, uh, tight quarters in some spaces, and then the galleries would open up quite widely. But uh, paintings were and artwork were hung in gallery style from ceiling to floor. Art was everywhere. And if anyone knows the Getzman and Getzman book, West of the Imagination, at least half of the artwork from that book was in this collection. So I was walking around with my mouth open the majority of the time. <clears throat> Thoroughly impressed, but uh, that was great to get that private tour. And that night, we had some celebrations. I believe that was Ansley's birthday that night. Is that right, Joyce? It was your birthday, okay. And then Ansley's was... Okay, I just knew that they were together. So we were celebrating birthdays nonetheless. So we were, uh, here we were out at dinner um, having fun with the group there and more beautiful vistas to share along the way, just because it's so gorgeous, you can't sh not show some of these. And then we were on to um, uh, Herb Minery's studio. And this is a sculpture in our collection, you may recognize it's at the bottom of the stairs um, in our lower um, sculpture court area. And he's, a, of course, a very accomplished bronze artist. But he was raised on a family ranch in Nebraska. It had been in his, hand, the, his family's hands for over 100 years. And he always thought he was going to be a rancher. But um, his love of art led him to illustration and um, later commercial art. And his cartoons actually gained uh, national exposure and have appeared in numerous publications, such as Western Horse Magazine. Uh, and he, but he cast his first bronze sculpture in 1973, and he devoted himself to that medium thereafter. Uh, he fell in love with it. He was fascinated by the fluid movement he could produce by the sculpture and how it could really capture um, the, uh, the meaning of cowboys and horseback and the roping aspects and driving cattle. So that really just drew him in completely. He is a member of Cowboy Artists of America as well. And when he met his wife, he was a Western singer. So I wanted to share that with you because he, uh, from Seth's request, played a couple of songs for us. And he still got it. He has still got it. He has a great voice. So let's take a listen uh, to Herb. Uh, here he is again with the group. This morning, I couldn't take it Just 
So anyway, I thought that was really cool, personally. <laughs> and uh, just jumping back real quick before we do go to Kent Olberg, I wanted to show you, too, that he also um, is an author and illustrator of children's books. So The Barry Brook Tales, which is available on Amazon, um, you can find his books there. So again, he just continues to produce art and create. Um, it's, it's nonstop. <laughs> We're going to go on now to Kent Olberg's studio, and as awestruck as I was over Thomas Blackshear and um, all of the other artists we were meeting and how wonderful they were, it seemed like every time you turned around a corner to go into another studio, you had that same feeling for this other artist, and Kent Olberg was definitely one of those. Um, we were in Loveland, Colorado here, and Kent and his wife were just the most adorable couple ever. He uh, was born in Sweden. And he grew up in this tiny fishing village, and he told us the story pretty much of his life and what brought him to the United States and his love of the American West. Because he was truly, truly um, awestruck by what he saw uh, when, he, when he came to the U.S. and ended up staying. But there's a story behind it. So he grew up in a fishing village. Um, his family had always been fishermen, and he talked about the sea creatures, how much he loved the sea creatures. He'd be out on the fishing boat. He'd be knee-deep in sea creatures, and it was the most wonderful thing ever. But his grandfather kind of knew this way of life was going away and said, you know, you, you really need to go to school. So they sent him off the island to go to high school, and he ended up going to uh, university in the 1960s and studying art. And in the 1960s, in art school, he sculpted a bear. And you might think, well, big deal. Well, that was when abstract expressionism was all over the place. And his professor proceeded to tell him he would never make it as an artist. You cannot sculpt bears. You must do abstract expressionism. Um, so he was distraught to hear that um, because that he really loved sculpting um, things from nature. That was his, his influence um, and his love. But he went on with his life um, and went on to work in museums in the Natural History Museum in A Africa and Botswana. And Denver began building an Africa exhibition and he spent some weeks in the wild with the Denver crew who were out there protecting them from the wildlife. And the Denver Broncos owner was a board member of the Denver Natural Science Museum and flew Kent back to the United States to Denver to thank him for taking care of them while they were there. And he offered him the job to curate the, uh, the African exhibition. So he accepted and by the time 1976 rolled around Western art began to become popular again. So he realized he could do what he loved and make a living, and that was it. He was sold, that was it. He committed himself to it from that point on. Um, he stayed after being swayed. They took him to see bison, and they took him to see all of these things that you know he could only imagine, and um, you know he never looked back. Um, right now he lives in Corpus Christi, Texas, but he has a studio in Loveland uh, because of all the foundries in the area. Uh, but he was elected by his peers as a full accommodation. And um, his artwork, needless to say, is monumental. Uh, when you first walked in his studio, uh, it was a smaller space with smaller maquettes, but soon he opened the doors to this part of the warehouse <laughs> where everyone just kind of walked in, kind of like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. We were all kind of walking around like this. Um, just mesmerized uh, by these pieces that we were seeing, um, these, these monumental pieces, and, and that's what he's known for, these monumental size works. Uh, and um, he uh, used an oil-based clay so that these never dry out, and he ordered from the same batch to ensure that the color consistency was there. So you can see all of the different animals he sculpted over time. If he needs to recast them, they're ready to go. You can see the scale here with um, one of our circle members uh, standing beside. Um, this this one here and this is a wider shot of the studio and I think Seth grabbed this off of his phone to show everyone one of his sculptures in place at Nova um, Nova University and it's a shark coming up out of the ground so you can see the head and the tail you know popping up out of the ground uh, and that's something that he's known for this, these artwork these installations monumental installations that span city blocks with animals crashing into buildings and one half of them might be inside and the other half might be outside um, pretty cool. So here's one example. <laughs> so look him up if you haven't because it's, I can't, I can't, I don't have enough time to talk about him. So we have to move on. 
Um, but I did want to show, this was a, a Mastodon um, to, uh, to show the size of it. I asked Joyce to stand in front of it so you could get an idea of how big the sculpture is. And this is outside the Denver Museum of Nat uh, Natural Science, of Nature and Science, sorry. It's 14 feet tall and it was put outside in 2014 there in Denver. So it gives you an idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with oil, um, Joyce was saying he mentioned that he can reuse the clay because it's oil-based clay, so it never dries out. So if he needed to use it, he said he had taken a couple of them a, you know, apart to, to recap, you know, to remold for other things. But yeah, that was really interesting. So we, we uh, left there and we uh, visited the Columbine Gallery next. This outdoor sculpture garden was really beautiful. The birch trees were definitely keeping an eye on us. Um, as we were walking through, but it was really lovely. We had lunch because there's always food. And we also had a great group shot here in the garden. So this is a group shot of everyone that attended that circle trip. We soon headed on because there's no break. We're go, 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 uh, which is great because we were able to fit so much in, we go to George Lundin's studio next. So if you guys know this sculpture, does anyone know the sculpture? Yes. This sculpture is upstairs in our presidential gallery. Thomas Jefferson, of course, and George Lundin is the sculptor. He hails from um, Nebraska, but he's a nationally um, known sculptor of realistic figures. Uh, he also has full um, status at the National Academy of Design in New York and uh, he lives in, in Loveland, Colorado with his family. His, I think his wife's a sculptor. He's, he comes from a family of sculptors. There were several of his family represented in the studio. Uh, as we walked into his studio, this is one that was a studio, and again, an historic building, and it was multi-levels. So it was, we were kind of moving through narrow staircases and um, some outdoor staircases uh, to get down to other parts of his studio and his workspace. Uh, in this particular area, there's a maquette uh, in the background of a commission he was working on, and you can see sources for his artwork. He uses photographs, um, uniforms, um, lots of different things to make sure that his uh, work is historically accurate. He also was able to talk to us a little bit about lost wax casting. He had his molds in one particular area, um, so we were able to, to see some of those. And then we were on the road again. And our next stop was to the studio of Ed Dwight. And so, again, another starstruck moment with, with Ed Dwight. Uh, he has been recognized here at the Booth Museum a few years ago as an artist of excellence. Um, but he, besides being a phenomenal artist, if you don't know anything about Ed, you need to find out about Ed because he was actually the first African-American to be trained as an astronaut in the NASA program under the Kennedy administration. Um, he, uh, he joined the Air Force in 1953. Um, he was a United States Air Force test pilot, uh, earned a degree in aeronautical engineering. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, he was on the cover of Ebony Jet, um, all these magazines around the world for being the first African-American astronaut trainee in 1962. He faced a lot of discrimination after the Kennedy administration and left. And, um, in the 1970s turned to art. And we're glad he did because he has produced literally like George Lundin uh, or like um, Kent Ulberg, monumental size works. Um, so he went to art school at the University of Denver and um, he learned how to operate the university's metal casting foundry and uh, received his master's of fine art as a, uh, and gained a reputation as a, as a phenomenal sculptor. So he has done sculptures all over uh, the world. Um, he's on permanent display at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and I just want to show him in a space. He is, even though he's a small man, he is so gregarious and warm and friendly. He just pulls everyone in. He has the best stories ever. So he shared a lot of stories with us. I just unfortunately don't have time to share those with you today. But what he's holding in his hands is a maquette of a, uh, the Texas African American Hist uh, History Memorial outside of the Texas Capitol. It was 27 feet high and 32 feet long. And it um, kind of encapsulated African-American history from 1500s to the present. So that's just one of his works. He's worked, you know, uh, with Nelson Mandela, um, 
presidents. I could go on and on and on. His studio here, you can see, is massive. This is, uh, reflects a lot of the work that he did on, in a jazz series, as it was called, um, which was really uh, interesting to see. And here we have a picture of him, because this was just too cute to not put in here, um, Ed and Diane. Diane, of course, our, our uh, membership director, standing side by side. They were about the same height. Um, and then we were on to another studio. We were on to Sandy Graves, um, who's not represented in our collection yet, but she was born in Denver. She's a phenomenal um, artist. Uh, and I think her artwork is really unique and, and cool because of the negative space that you see here. It actually costs more, she said, to cast these at the foundry with this negative space uh, versus you know, a full bronze that would have been um, you know, cast in, in a more complete form without without that. So that was really interesting. But she was an art teacher for years, so she's dear to my heart for that. Um, and if we take a look here, we can see her outside of her home in Denver. Her studio was in her home, uh, working there. And to the right, Lisa Wheeler, our um, Director of Curatorial Services, presenting Sandy with a book uh, on Warhol in the West, which we were able to present to all of our um, esteemed hosts for the trip. We were on next to Denver to a beautiful historic house that um, housed the studio of Michael Unty. And Michael studied at the University of, of Denver, um, but again, during the time he studied, abstract expressionism was very popular and he was just tired of it, so he left. And he bought an old truck and he traveled around the country and he taught himself how to draw and paint along the way. Um, so you can see this beautiful uh, nocturne here. This is in our collection, and he likes to paint tiny little nocturnes that he'll um, actually put up on auction on his website, uh, and he calls them his little Remingtons. So they were just beautiful little pieces. Uh, but again, he, he lives and works in a 100-year-old house with his, his wife uh, and his, uh, his two children. Now, Michael actually provided a painting demo for us, which was something different. So again, with each of these experiences and each of the artists, it was something unique and different. Uh, so a painting demo here, he explained how he gridded his canvas, laid out his composition, and how he adheres to the golden ratio principles in his work, which is an you know, ancient... Um, design principles used by da Vinci and Botticelli and Michelangelo um, and how the golden ratio creates that really that pleasing effect that is that aesthetic for the eye so he strongly adheres to that and was explaining that as he was working we were on the road again and through the beautiful vistas and here we are in Steamboat Springs at the Steamboat Grand Hotel and downtown Steamboat Springs uh, this is the Steamboat Spring Art Museum and downtown area uh, we were able to, uh, to visit, and we also visited three other galleries uh, that hosted us for lunch the following day, Wild Horse, Pine Moon, and Jack Romnick Galleries. They were um, very gracious, as everyone was. I know I'm overusing that word, but it, it really um, describes everyone to a T. Beautiful pieces of artwork uh, from some artists who are, are working currently in this, in this Western market. Uh, we went next to John Fawcett to, to kind of really end our trip. We also um, visited the Piasics, who are chairs of our gala this year, but they have a house, and I'll share an image of them more towards the end because they were some gracious hosts. Craig McNabb also hosted us at his home. Um, I just want to mention that because, uh, they again, we were there for an evening. I didn't feel comfortable taking photos in his personal home, so um, I don't have any photos of that, but... Um, we were at John Fawcett's and that was fine. Um, John Fawcett began um, his life as a veterinarian. So he spent the very uh, whole first half of his life as a veterinarian. So that gave him, I think, a really unique perspective of animal anatomy. Uh, and uh, he did that for 20 years. Um, and then he ended up um, coming into his own as a full-time artist. And that was in 1996. So he sold his veterinary practice in Pennsylvania. And he and his wife, Elizabeth, started building a construction of a log home in Colorado, which is where they live now. And look at this vista. This is what, if you turned yourself around 360 degrees, this is what, you got a view like this. No, no matter where you turned, you had this type of view that was just stunning. Um, and the right is the interior of the home in his studio, and um, John is talking to us about his artwork. He works in watercolor um, and also in oil, and he most recently received the Idle Jorg Purchase Award in the Quest for the West Art Show and Sale. Um, here's another image of him with our member folks in his home. 
it was time to leave. <sighs> um, so as we're, we're leaving the hotel and we're boarding the bus and we're going to end this just with uh, the image of the Piasics, uh in their home because I think we all took a thousand pictures while we were here looking out over this rail and here we have um, the Piasics on the left and Seth and Joyce on the right um, and we'll see the Piasics again in February for the gala but uh, one of the most breathtaking, I think, homes I've ever seen uh, or visited uh, with between the vistas and the artwork, it was just amazing. And such, again, beautiful hosts too, to allow us to come into their home. So we'll end it again, just with some beautiful images. As we were leaving, we got a little bit of mist and rain, um, but still some uh, gorgeous images. And I figured we would end the program today with this beautiful sunset. Joyce, was this yours? Seth's? Okay, yeah. So um, we're going to end the program there. And I want to thank you guys for going on this journey with me again to recap it. Um, had a, it was, again, an, a, an amazing time. Uh, it's hard to put into words and explain what happens on these trips and um, the personal um, stories with these artists. So I hope I was able to kind of give you a little bit of, of uh, an idea of how special these trips really are. And for all of those that were able to go with us um, on this trip, again, this was the first time I had gone. It was an experience like no other. So thank you guys for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed your lunch. <laughs>